Well, it's a uh, it's eleven o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everybody. This is renewable natural gas (RNG). We're going to be focusing on the processing of RNG or renewable natural gas. So, uh, to stay in the know, if something happens, you have a meeting, someone walks in, people are working from home, your kid walks in, or your internet goes down. We will be recording this and uploading it to our YouTube channel, so you can kind of go to that, especially if you have certain things you really want to look for. You can do a search find on the transcript, uh, but do check it out. Uh, we also will be referencing other items, uh, processing equipment in this uh, webinar today, so we have other blogs on those items, and we'll be mentioning that, so you can go to those things to find out more information. Now, I'm meeting the speakers. My name is Cameron Croft. I'm the CEO of Croft Production Systems. Uh, we have Charlize Sparks joining us today. She'll actually be leading it. We're going to be taking credit for all her work, but she's our research and development engineer uh, for Croft Production Systems. And then we have Chris Smithson, uh, director of engineering. He's been on uh, a lot of our different webinars, and he gets the credit and the blame for a lot of things that happen at Croft. So they will be our speakers today. Now, what we start focusing on is renewable natural gas, uh, trying to outline the major topics, getting frequently asked questions from our clients. So we broke it down below, and this is what the webinar is going to be on today, is the overview of RNG, breaking down what is RNG, where does it come from, and then how is it processed. Uh, processing equipment, benefits of the RNG, and then also the market drivers, subsidies, things of that nature. Now, in today's uh, topic. It is not just a webinar, but also a roundtable structure. So if you have any questions, I have opened up the chat function in the question and answer function. So if there's anything in particular that Charlize and Chris are covering that you really want to hear a little bit more about, please put those uh, questions in the notes. And then when it gets into that natural stopping point, then I'll be asking those questions so that way they can answer your questions. Now, uh, kicking it off, Charlize, uh, if you can break down the first topic of what is renewable natural gas. Okay, thanks, Cameron. Um, so we'll just dive right in. What is renewable natural gas? Um, it's otherwise known as sustainable natural gas, biomethane, or green gas, but not to be confused with the greenhouse gas, because that's kind of what we're trying to avoid here. Um, it's uh, comparable to fossilized natural gas. Uh, the chemical identity of it is suitable to be injected into gas pipelines. Um, and it's at this point, not by no means a replacement, of course, for fossil fuels, but certainly an alternative or a supplement, if you will. Um, we, when we discuss uh, sustainability in energy, you want to strive to renew and reuse versus depleting natural resources. So as time goes on, you know, can possibly grow to be a main source of the energy that we consume. Now, um, I was actually practicing this last night with my oldest son, uh, who is 10, but he, uh, when I was mentioning it to him, what a re renewable natural gas was and kind of going through the presentation, he goes, it's interesting. So you, you get uh, energy from poop. So out of all the conversation I had to him, he found out that poop was it. And uh, so I have limited it down, but he brought out his poop jokes. And uh, so I will mention three only during this. And that's my contribution to this. I'll allow y'all to be the smartest person in the room. Um, and I know poop jokes are not everybody's favorite, but they're at least my, you know, they're a good solid number two, but do do. So that's one. Now I'm going to kick it off to the next one. But um, so I know it's not just poop, but where does uh, RNG come from? So when we're talking about traditionally where our natural gas comes from, um, we're digging into the depths of the earth, right? So it's this decomposed matter from centuries over. Um, and the alternative to that is uh, RNG is sourced from the surface, and it's just naturally occurring methane that happens at the surface. So we can, there's a little bit more on the next slide on that. All right. So we'll see this uh, flow chart a few times here, just kind of giving you the idea, the overall uh, idea of 
where we're going, how we're RNG, where it comes from, and what it, what we do to it, and then our end game here. Okay, so where does uh, RNG come from? Um, so we'll find RNG um, naturally occurring in covered landfills or covered lagoons um, in wastewater facilities, but you'll also um, see where wastewater and crop waste and dairy farm manure, not, you know, not just dairy farm manure, it would be any agricultural, um, you know, hog farms and chicken farms also contribute to that as well. Um, that's where you'll take that waste from those facilities and then they'll go into anaerobic digesters to produce the biogas. All right, so I know uh, landfills, wastewater, crop waste, um, we're kind of, I guess, going into the, the sources of, uh, so we're talking about that next. You got biogas and then biomethane. That's what we're discussing later on, right? The mm -hmm. differences. Yeah. yeah, we start at, with biogas and then um, and we'll go through it and, you know, after anaerobic digestion and when it's conditioned and everything, we'll end up with biomethane or renewable natural gas. Yeah. So our next step in the discussion, we'll talk about anaerobic digestion. All right. So, okay, there are a lot of words on this page, but um, basically, <laughs> so <laughs> anaerobic digestion is the process of breaking down organic matter in uh, an environment that lacks oxygen. So if you are familiar with composting, that's in, that we'll call that an aerobic process because in that you do have oxygen. It's not an airtight um, uh, breakdown here. So anaerobic digestion, lack of oxygen. Um, and so that the optimal conditions here, absence of oxygen with relatively warm, we're looking between 95 and 98 degrees Fahrenheit to get the optimal production. Um, and then from there, it's, uh, It'll take anywhere from five to 90 days. It depends on your feedstock makeup and it'll depend on just how oxygen deficient you are and then your temperatures. So like, for example, if you have a covered landfill or a covered lagoon. Oh, you paused on Where this. it snows or just, you know, up north somewhere. Oh no. Oh, you're fine. Pause, okay. Um, uh, well, where was I? If you have a covered landfill or, um, so pausing now, if you have a cover, like a covered lagoon in a colder climate, you'll, uh, find that your biogas production, especially in those sort of naturally occurring, um, environments won't be as great as right. inside of an anaerobic digester where you can uh, control the temperature inside of an anaerobic digester. Now, um, I guess from the, you got the inlet, so you said the feedstock coming in, um, and then you got the outlet composition of the gas coming off it. Do you think, uh, I guess the different feedstocks, if you go into like more fiber content, or if you're pulling from different farms or something like that, do you think that it actually changes the, the gas composition? Yes, like it the, does. Um, so you'll have a, you'll have where it's a co-digesters, well, where they'll take you know a mixture of whether it's you know dairy farm manure or the crop waste, put those together, and they'll develop different uh, um, bio makeups. Um, the other thing is is like chicken manure. There, it's it's very good in biogas production, but it contains a lot of ammonia. So so a lot of companies will tend to avoid the chicken manure. Huh. Um, so that's, you know, something to consider. It is very good in biogas production where you could get a lot of it, but then it contains a lot more ammonia where you don't really see that in uh, dairy farm manure or in crop waste. Chris, do you have anything to uh, ask on that or add on to it? Because I know you're working on four or five projects right now. Yeah, and those are all um, these kind of uh, purpose-built digester type ones. Um, you know, the, we did a landfill one a while back. So it's like landfill and, and your, your uh, wastewater, you know, those, those are kind of more retrofits where, you know, the, um, the, the manure or the crop waste or those would, would have these purpose-built digesters. 
So it kind of changes up, you know, what the existing equipment may be already on site. All right, well, the, um, all right, for the second joke, I have to add. Um, so my son ate four cans of alphabet soup yesterday, and now he's about to have the biggest bowel movement. So there you go. Again, digestion. So it, it matches, it correlates. <laughs> Um, all right, so this is a quick example. I know you found it uh, an image, but it's just an uh, example of an anaerobic digestion. Yeah, so you'll see these um, circular towers here and the, the uh, sort of domed uh, oh. roof there. Uh, you'll take behind it, you'll see those uh, lagoons. You'll take your wastewater. This is a wastewater facility in California. Um, you'll take the wastewater there and you'll pump it into your anaerobic digester. Um, and then it'll do everything that it needs to do. Um, you know, I guess if you really wanted to know like the science behind the anaerobic digestion, it goes from, uh, it breaks down in water first, called mm -hmm. hydrolysis, and then um, it'll break down into an acid, so acidogenosis. And then um, after that, it'll start the fermentation process that's acetogenosis, and then um, then you have your methane production to end with. Smokes. Now, I guess um, everyone keeps pushing the the ESG initiatives. I mean, does this follow under that? Now, then, Chris, do you think it kind of follows under that? I mean, it's more. It's like one of those things, like those aquaponic systems, where they can't call it organic because organic means that it's approved chemicals that they spray on it. So it's more no designation because it's it can't be called organic because it's actually more natural. So I mean, for aquaponics, is that kind of this is not ESG because it's actually taking waste? Or well, I mean, it depends on regionally, I guess, what they're defining as as you know carbon reduction i mean it, it you know putting using anaerobic digestion in a wastewater facility versus just you know off gassing that the you know the the gases that are produced in that with a standard system you know it, it is it is you're, you're recovering that carbon yeah you know if you if you're recovering it then you burn it you know you're carbon neutral it's not a carbon negative so but at least you know you're it's it's better to burn it than it is to you know send it up that's what you know originally landfills just had flares um but now you know you can actually use that gas so it's it's basically like you never you know you use it for fuel if you use it for you know turn it into power technically the carbon it's carbon neutral because you didn't actually emit anything so you could call it equivalent to let's say solar power where you, you know carbon was emitted in the um the actual production of it assuming that that would have just been released on its own but i guess it really just depends on what the politicians decide they want to they want to label it oh. Well, thank you for not answering my question. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just weird. It's, yeah, you're absolutely right of who wants to define it and what the overall goal is. Now, on the next one, you have a, one is a RNG processing facility. So is this a typical facility that we've seen or on your research? Yeah, so um, it'll go, you know, and, and this is something that we'll talk about further, too, is just you'll see typically what it looks like and the process that it's going to go to once it's moved from your digester into a processing facility. Um, and uh, like, well, again, it, just, it comes a little bit later when we're talking about it, but first, you know, you're going to go through your separation process and um, then your acid, um, you know, produce your acids before your acid and acid gases, and then you'll uh, go to dehydrate it and you'll be left with biomethane there. So. Well, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of in your flow chart on the next one. So mm -hmm. from, we were just talking about the anaerobic digester, and then now it's moving into the next phase. So if you can explain this flow chart to us. Okay. So um, typically after your anaerobic digestion, you're left with two things, um, biogas and your digestate. And biogas by itself, um, which I guess I don't want to repeat myself with the next one, but the next slide, I believe it, uh, biogas just raw as it is, can be used to produce heat as well as electricity. And then when you're left with whatever's on the bottom of your digester, um, 
is they call it cake, which I have no idea why you would want to call anything like that cake, but <laughs> it'll turn into a, uh, you know, it's good to use as fertilizer. Um, the uh, wet digestate could be used to uh, fertilize uh, farms. Well, that's what we are actually talking to one of our clients and uh, what they were doing is um, it's actually the chicken farm actually down the road from us. They built those like slurry tanks, or what you were saying, those waste tanks, those long troughs that you had uh, the picture earlier. They were taking it off that, venting it off, um, for well, just trying to get as much as they can. And then their bulldozers, right, Chris, start coming in and they would roll it, dry it out even further. And then they would sell this like high grade fertilizer because it's just like a, it was a slurry, but now it's dried up slurry. And they sell it and it, I guess they call it cake. And then they compound it and trucks actually just come in, pick up this cake and leave. And then they're actually selling off the, um, um, the biogas as well. So it's just interesting the different revenue streams. You know, cake probably refers to either they're making what they call filter cake, where you, you run it through a filter and it just gets packed in there. And then you, you pop open the filter and it falls out as what looks like giant cakes. Or you have like a cake press type thing where you, you squeeze it, squish all the water out of it. And then you're left with a wonderful sponge cake of manure. <laughs> all right, so from the biogas and digest, uh, that flow chart you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. dive a little deeper into it. Okay, so here um, we are raw biogas. It'll be uh, about 50% methane and 50% CO2 carbon dioxide um, with trace amounts of other gas in it, but mostly just 50 50 there. Um, you can use it raw to power combustion engines. Um, you can sell it as is to be used, you know, in power, power grids. Um, but, you know, ideally it would get processed, especially for further use of it. Um, and again, the digestate here, so it's also called a biofertilizer. Um, it's nutrient rich. Uh, when you think about when you're driving down the road and you can smell the manure where in a neighborhood they just put up the new, uh, put up some mulch and you can smell it because, well, it's manure. So that's probably typically what they're using in the plants, the garden beds, the trees, and you can definitely spray it. Um, like I said, the uh, the liquid digestate. So what Chris was saying, when they you know compress those cakes, the liquid is a very nutrient rich as well, and can be used for um, to spread over farms fertilizing. That's kind of cool. That know um, was it one article they were talking about the uh, they were I guess using the slurry. And then they were shooting it out on the farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a mist that day, like it carried, the winds were blowing it hard. So it was going into a neighborhood that built it right next to these big farms. So their HOA was trying to sue the farmers um, for using, because it smelled. And then finally the farmers had to tell them like what was in the slurry. And they're like, you're just spraying us with everything, all the waste. And, and it's not my fault. You built these million dollar homes by this farm. Um, so probably props says like once it's run through the digester, it's actually, um, I mean, like you think of normal sewage and you're like, oh man, I'm going to get right. pee guy. Um, but once it's actually run through these digesters, it, it's, it's, you know, you can, if you're so inclined, hold it in your hands, like in the photo. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's purified of, of a lot of the, like the, the bad things that would, that would actually make you sick. And what you're left with is just the, you know, the, the fertilizer nutrients that the, the plants want. So it actually is a lot cleaner compared to what may just come off of just like a chicken poop lagoon or something, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you actually get a much higher quality product that's less likely to make people sick. Well, and um, so this is the, raw biogas digestate and then this is the biogas composition so this is before it's uh biomethane right biogas yeah. is before it. okay yeah. so um just pretty typical of what you'll see and what the chemical makeup of uh, biogas raw biogas so um we're looking here at agriculture waste and landfills and industrial waste so uh i don't know i guess if we go through the whole chart just um methane again 50 to 80 percent kind of across the board. Um, carbon dioxide here, it's about 30 to 50%. Um, again, across the board for that one. So you will have your H2S in there, um, higher in industrial ways, less in agriculture ways, um, and almost little to nothing in landfills. 
Um, you'll see that you have hydrogen and nitrogen in there as well and uh, trace amounts of oxygen, carbon monoxide. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom row there, the H2O is fully saturated. It's very wet, a very wet gas. Well, that, that's what we always had a hard time with is um, the high CO2 and H2S, right, Chris? was the uh, you know 30 to 50% CO2. That's just crazy amount. Yeah, and that's why um, it, it is difficult to run it. it like without any real processing running biogas for for like engine fuel is is rather difficult because the BTU is so low on this gas. So I mean that might, and CO2 doesn't have any BTU value to it. So all you're you're really doing is just watering down your your methane. You know, typical natural gas may actually be a mixture of other, you know, you have your ethane, maybe some propane, smaller compounds as you go lower. You don't have any of that heavy stuff to help balance you out. So you're trying to run, you know, an engine off of, you know, really low BTU gas, plus some of the other things, you know, hydrogen sulfide, th there's engines that'll run on it, but then you know, that's, that's a custom, you know, special fuel train compared to just standard off the line generators. You know, hydrogen can can create problems too. There's some material choice issues that you need with hydrogen, um, and some of these other things. Oxygen really is more of a corrosion problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just raw biogas uh, can can be problematic to to try to deal with if you're just trying to use it for for generation without any sort of processing. Well, the, sorry, so this is biogas, and I think on our next slide, all right, so the biogas, like we were explaining earlier, Charlize, you got biogas, and then it's raw form, you can go to hydroelectricity, but I guess the upgrade to that is the biomethane, so can you explain this section right here? Yeah, so we'll uh, go through the process of what you have to do to biogas in order to get it to the pipeline compatibility that we're looking for, um, and I mean, I guess when we move on to the next slide, then I'll describe more about that. But uh, you do, you want to take out all of your gas, gases, of course. I mean, it's similar to processing natural gas, fossil fuels. Um, you, you want to remove your acid gases. You want to remove all your water vapor. Um, you want to create the separation that you're not having any other thing come through except for your gas. So that it's just nice and clean and you're not going to have any trouble down the line. Well, we're going into the processing section of this. Uh, it, it's really hard because you're kind of going very high level view of biogas, uh, RNG, trying to get it into it. So I imagine there's probably specific questions that people have specifically for uh, RNG. Now, Charlize did a two hour like internal training with me and Chris and then our other engineering team and service team. So if that's something you're interested in, please let us know. We can, we can make sure that she can pull out the full enchilada, she'll, yeah, she'll make sure that you get the full two hours of what is RNG. But now transferring over to the processing section, um, yeah, break this down for us if you don't mind. Chris, do you, um, do you wanna take over this portion? Yeah, I can go least? through that, yeah. Okay. So um, I mean, this is the basic flow chart of, of how we're gonna clean up that gas to take it from biogas to biomethane. So the first thing really um, that, that we see typical of these kind of setups would be some sort of uh, separation and cooling um, to, to knock out just the bulk remove of maybe water. Um, compression is usually a, a one of the initial steps to, to boost the pressure because you're coming off the system at very low pressure and any sort of processing is going to work better at higher pressures. So especially if you're trying to feed into a natural gas pipeline, you're going to have to eventually end up at that pressure, you know, be it 100 PSI or 700 PSI. So um, initially cooling and then separating gets the bulk of the um, any sort of liquids out of the system. Um, acid gas removal is your next step just because you want to make sure any CO2 or H2S is removed. Um, pipeline spec for CO2 is going to be probably one to four p uh, percent um, for like a transmission line. It'll probably be in the PPM levels if you're trying to go into like a actual distribution line. Um, and then H2S is normally four PPM for, for transmission and then um, uh, completely eliminated for if you're actually trying to send it to, um, to end users. Uh, but yeah, acid gas is gonna be your, your biggest component and uh, probably your most expensive and hardest uh, stage. Um, to be able to get that because you're, you're looking at, you know, you have to remove half of the gas in there if it's 50% CO2. So that's a lot of work to separate out half of the gas from the other gas. 
Um, dehydration is next. Uh, depending on the quality of dehydration really depends on what your end use is. Um, different requirements, like if you're using it for CNG, that's going to be different than if you're putting it into a transmission line versus an end user line. So how dry mm -hmm. you need it is going to depend on your end use. And then once you have all that, then you have biomethane, which is the same thing as methane. It just came from a different source. So chemically, it's identical. It burns the same. There's, there's no other. Once you've removed all the other components, it, it really is just the same as what comes to your house. Now, when you were mentioning asset gas, H2S and CO2, what we saw earlier was that 30 to 40 percent CO2. I mean, so I'm just like compressor and cooler. I mean, are we looking at like a stainless compressor? Or what what type of compressor would handle that much CO2 in it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're going to need a lot of stainless. Um, uh, the, these facilities, like the landfill gas facilities, are, they're typically all stainless piping. Um, I mean, of course, you could, you know, it's a lot cheaper to go carbon steel um, so that you could, you know, just put some corrosion allowance on there with some testing, you could right. you can maintain that. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a lot of stainless just to, to keep that corrosion down because you know, especially on the inlet, you're, you're very wet. Once the, the lower the pressure, the, the less aggressive your corrosion is. So once you compress and then you go to high pressure, that's when your real corrosion issues are, are really going to be more noticeable. Um, so stainless, anything after a compression would, would be important. But then you're, yeah, there's, there's issues with, you know, running a compressor with, with that kind of levels of CO2. It can get in the oil, it can, it can create other problems mm -hmm. um, with, with real high acid gas amounts. Now, we do have a question. It says, uh, what is your biomethane spec targets, percent mole, CO2, H2S, and moisture? So what, so what would be the biomethane specs that you would see the target? It depends on, on how you're trying to sell it. So one of our clients, they just have to meet standard natural gas pipeline spec um, for, for going into like a transmission line. So they're, they're at seven pounds of water. They're at four PPM H2S and I think 1% CO2 because they're, they're, they're more up north where you usually don't see such a low CO2 spec. So that's all they have to meet. Um, because they're going into into a main line um, that, that I believe is going to further processing. Now we we did one a while back that they were um, they were using it all for CNG, so they were actually compressing it up and then delivering it for for on-site fuel use um, for other facilities. And that they just needed to dry enough to where they wouldn't have any sort of um, uh, water dew point issues when they when they tried to decompress mm -hmm. it through the back end. So they wanted the acid gas removed just because it, it affected the BTU quality of the engines that were running it. Um, but they just really needed the dehydration. I mean, we we targeted seven pounds. They really didn't need it less than that for what they were trying to do. But yeah, it's really the in use. I mean, if you were trying to go into like actual in use where you're you know sending it to your neighbor's house, then you're going to need to be at think 50 ppm co2 and zero ppm h2s and and negative 40 on the water dew point so it's gonna be a lot drier Charlie, is there anything that you've seen or you want to add to that uh no i think chris covered all of that okay he's very good at that mm -hmm. He drives it home. All right. So actually, one of the follow-up questions was that: Could you go straight to LNG specs? 100 ppm CO2, 5 ppm with amine and negative 70 water dew point with your dehydration. Ooh, negative 70 Celsius. So with our dehydration, um, the our dehydration that Croft offers is, is glycol systems and, and our passive dehydration system. We're typically targeting pipeline spec. We can get below, you know, maybe down to one, um, uh, one pound per million, but we're not going to get down to like the, uh, the water spec that LNG would require. Um, for, for the R available dehydration. Now this is a, biogas is a good, uh, or biomethane is a good component or applicant for LNG just because it, it does have most of the other stuff removed out of it. So once you get it pure enough, you are really just dealing with methane. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, LN, LNG is a, is a tighter spec to, to have to hit with that. And yeah, I see the question. So yeah, we would need to get, uh, additional uh, steps to get it from pipeline spec down to the LNG spec, probably some sort of sieve or something to, to really eliminate all the, um, the, the last bit of the components that are in there. Okay. 
So after this dehydration right here, I guess it would be the next one would be a mole sieve to get into yeah. LNG spec. Yeah, yeah, and okay. that would that would get because everything we're really looking at is is bulk removal, and then that right. like a mole sieve would would really take you down to those ppm levels of everything. All right. Well, on the the next thing, it was the um, the separation portion. This is a big chunk on that. So, uh, Charlize, you want to talk about that? Okay. So, um, of course, just following our processes of how we first we want to take out you know bulk removal. Like I said, it's fully saturated. There's a lot of water in it, a lot of water vapor. Um, you'll want to go ahead and do the bulk removal um, and take out all of your water first. Um, take out any particulates that may have come along the way in the process. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, obviously you don't want to have any issues downstream if you're not taking out any of these particulates and as well as uh, any, you know, lots of water. So here, I don't know, Chris could probably talk a little bit better to that, but uh, that's just going to be here your first, your first big step. Yeah, that's this the initial things that we'd like to have ahead of any sort of further processing equipment. Um, proper filtration is always good too. Less than one micron, should really get that gas clean, squeeze out some of that that water that may be coming through there. Um, it reduces the, the downstream requirements. And then a lot of um, a lot of people use membrane systems for their for their further processing um, that they do to like remove out CO2. And I mean, a membrane systems need really good filtration ahead of them um, just because the, the size of the pores on those membranes are, are so incredibly small that you really need good filtration or else you're gonna be changing out membranes and that can get pretty expensive. I know we don't have a lot of good, uh, all right, you see the two, pic the two filters right here to the left, but, if you do want to learn more, we got some great animations. We actually done one webinar on filtration by itself. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in that and separation, go check out the other webinars and the blogs that we have on that. But now on the next section, going into the more of the acid gas removal, the H2S side first, uh, Chris, talk a little bit about the, our IOS or iron oxide system. Yeah, so we usually like to remove H2S first just because it's it's dangerous and corrosive. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a, a good thing to remove. There's a lot of systems, like an amine system can remove both H2S and CO2. Um, you just, the amine system doesn't destroy the H2S, uh, whereas the iron oxide system can be beneficial because it actually does uh, destroy the H2S. It converts it um, from H2S into iron sulfide. And then that, that's a solid product that can be disposed of in a landfill. Um, so the iron oxide system, it's basically rust. It's iron oxide pellets, and they, um, they react with the H2S. Um, they stay as the pellet in, the, in that pellet form. And then you basically just have a vessel with this dry bed product in it that it's absorbing the H2S, neutralizing it. And then you have clean gas coming out the top. And these are pretty popular in, um, in landfill applications. Um, also because it's cheap for them to dispose of it because they can just throw the, uh, the used up product in a landfill. Um, but yeah, it, is, it works at a big range of pressures down to ounces of pressure. So it's, a, and it's very good at, at handling various flow rates. So you can handle really low flow rates and higher, as long as you're you know, properly sized for the higher rate, you can ha have a really good turn down with these systems. Uh, but they're very simple. They just, the dry bed of media in there absorbs the H2S, gas leaves. Uh, free of the H2S, assuming it's properly sized. That's good. Well, I, uh, like you said, we've got to treat H2S first because it's a safety issue and it, you know, with water, it turns into a sulfuric acid, so it's corrosive to equipment. But then we go into a naming plant. I know we have CO2 removal, but the naming plant can't remove H2S and CO2, so talk a little bit about that component. Yeah, and so CO2 is the, the biggest thing, that, the most thing that we're trying to remove out of the gas. It's the biggest percentage of a contaminant that we want gone out of it. So the, um, the, the Amy plant, while well, it can get the H2S and the CO2 out, it just uh, it does capture it and then it releases it at lower pressure. So then you'd still have to deal with the H2S because you, you really you usually can't just emit H2S because of the, uh, the health concerns associated with it. Um, CO2, you can emit, you just get a permit for it, um, just like a tailpipe on, on a, an engine or something. Um, but yeah, so the, in Amy, if you're using an Amy plant to remove both, you may need tail gas treatment to deal with that H2S 
HUS. Um, but amine plants are, are industry standard for bulk removal of CO2. Um, there's there's you know, a number of companies that do them that have experience with them. The operators are, are pretty familiar with them. Um, and so it's a really good way for bulk CO2 removal. Uh, for the, the amounts of CO2 that need to be removed, I don't think there's really anything that's, that's cheaper um, because it is a regenerative process. You're using the same chemical over and over again uh, to remove bulk amounts of, of CO2. Membranes can, they, they can remove quite a bit of CO2, um, but they, they do have a lot of slip gas that, that sneaks through the membrane on the CO2 side. So that can be a little wasteful. Um, whereas the amine plant, it will need some fuel for, for heat and everything um, for its process, but it, it really just does grab the CO2. So there, there can be uh, beneficial if you, if you really are just targeting CO2 removal for that. Now, that is one of the, you were mentioning that earlier, the regeneration, and that actually popped up the question for the iOS system before you were talking about it's not regenerative, right? So it's like a batch process. Yes, yeah. So it, it can be partially regenerated with the addition of oxygen. And if you do have some oxygen coming in through the system, um, the oxygen actually will uh, help to regenerate it a little bit. Um, just because of the the it can only be regenerated partially. It's usually not looked at as effective to do regeneration on um, on the iOS systems, uh, but it is this is typically just a batch process where once it's it's absorbed and it's no longer, and you're starting to see some H2S breakthrough um, through the system, then it is just completely replaced. Now, how long, um, I guess it's H2S to neutralize it on the iOS system. So. When does it tell you that it's depleted? When you start seeing H2S on the outlet rise or? Yeah, normally we, we do, um, uh, we'll have multiple ports up the side if you have a single vessel. That way we can take readings um, along, across multiple levels of the system. It's right. a, it's a down, downward flow to the vessel. So, uh, but if you have two vessels, uh, you usually have a little more convenience there because you only have to look at the second vessel or, uh, or the first vessel, the outlet to see if you have any breakthrough. Once you have breakthrough, um, you know your second vessel is gonna take care of everything and it's just time to um, isolate replace and then you flip flop things you usually set them up in a lead lag configuration right. um but but yeah you do need to keep an eye on it um the benefit of the ios is it is it's just absorbing however much h2s comes through so your your actual lifespan varies depending on how much h2s is coming into the system well we even had a follow-up question on that uh are there any uses for the spent media for the ios iron oxide um it, it makes a very interesting gravel for your driveway um, <laughs> I've, I've seen, there's some company, one, one of the main companies that, that offers the product, they, I've seen some, uh, we actually got to see their facility and they were trying to grow, um, they had, they got tomatoes, they were going tomatoes in a, in a planter box and they were right. using this as, as part of the media for it to just basically to prove that, you know, it could be used because it, I mean, it is iron oxide. It's, it's made of iron oxide that theirs were iron oxide coated, uh, clay pellets. So there's nothing inherently toxic about um, what's there. The the downside to using it in um, any sort of natural gas process is that it, it could absorb things that, that may potentially be toxic, um, mm -hmm. compressor oils, uh, you know, silohexanes, any sort of there's there's some contaminants that may get into it that it's not really seen as something that that can be uh, effectively have a, an in use. Normally, it's just sent to landfill. Um, but it's not, it's not a toxic item. It, it's normally just gets like easy non-hazardous disposal to a landfill and it's just sent to a, to a landfill, um, for disposal. Okay. So a driveway or a planter box. That's what you're saying. Okay. Well, uh, that was on the aiming plant. So we removed the H2S and the CO2, uh, what we were <clears throat> talking about earlier. Now it kind of goes into the dehydration component of it. Um, Okay, sorry. Before we get on the passive dehydration system, it said uh, we have one follow-up on the amine side. Could you pass the amine small rich acid gas tail flow, 98% CO2 and 2% H2S through the IOS instead of removing the H2S from the larger inlet flow and thus having a much smaller IOS system? You could, yeah. Yeah, you could use the IOS uh, strictly for tail gas treatment. And, and use that and that, that would make for a much smaller um, vessel because you're sizing based on your, your volume going through there. It'd be a good um, uh, you, polishing unit, right? 
to kind of clean it up? Kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, it's you're it's not really polishing because you're still it still get the same amount of H two S. It's just a lot more concentrated. So instead of okay. like you know two hundred ppm, now you have two percent because you, your volume is much, much smaller, but still the same amount of H2S to remove. So while you would, while you could get away with a smaller vessel, um, typically what's determining the vessels is the, uh, the runtime that you need. So if you want to last, you know, 60 days, then you're going to need a certain size of vessel anyway. Um, so just to hold the amount of media that you need to run, to match that runtime, they are kind of a pain to change out because it is a manual, you know, physically intensive process to flood it, dump everything out, completely wash out the vessel, refill mm -hmm. it with media. Um, that usually takes three days. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what the, like how much H2S you actually do have to remove. Cause you may end up with the same size vessel just because of the amount of H2S you need to remove to have a decent runtime. All right, well, um, on the passive dehydration system side, cause this is the last major component of processing, right? For yeah, we usually like to have everything else taken care of before we, we deal with dehydration. So we like the contaminants out because the contaminants usually have other issues. Um, once, once you've removed the H2S and the CO2, then you don't have to be NACE anymore. So NACE is the, the you know, NACE piping, NACE vessel construction that, that adds a lot of cost for that, that H2S or corrosion resistant uh, construction methods. So we don't need to be nace anymore once we get, you know, past that stuff. So it usually is easier to, you know, otherwise if we did try to do this first, you know, we don't want to, you don't want to dehydrate before an aiming plant because then you're just going to resaturate everything. So there's certain processes that, that just make more sense at the downstream and dehydration is usually one of the last things that, that you take care of. Um, passive dehydration system works similar to the iOS system where it is a dry bed of media in a vessel. The gas flows through it, sucks the water out, um, except that with our crop passive dehydration systems, the product actually dissolves into a salt water as it sucks the water out of the gas. And then you just uh, replenish the consumed amount. You don't have to replace the entire media bed. Right. Um, so these, and then we size them based on like, these are in the picture, on the, in the picture, those are pretty big ones. Those are 60 inch diameter vessels, but we have them all different sizes. The ones that we've been sending out for the RNG applications are, um, are 36 inch diameter vessels. And they're, they're mainly used for polishing systems where they're linking multiple facilities together. And ours is the last system, um, just making sure that everything was dry uh, when it got to the, uh, the final uh, sales transfer point to the, uh, to the actual um, pipeline company that's gonna be transporting the gas. Well, that's actually one of the questions was, um, or one of the questions I have when you're talking about it, like the, the passive dehydration system, um, the Croft unit, we, we can see various flows coming in and out. So you can go all the way down to zero, you can come back online. It only uh, treats when the water hits the system. Or other standard glycol equipment, you've got you know, a turn down rate that if it stopped flow completely, the thing will eventually you know, shut down um, to stop so Charlize when you're seeing the plants I mean is there a consistent flow from these RNG facilities or is there like they're only flowing during the day um like making the input consistent on the the gas coming in uh you know that's not something that I'm familiar with but um it would you know I imagine it wouldn't be a constant flow all day um it's just you know as as they are getting their source from their digesters and coming through the facility. Um, you know, you would transport your uh, biogas from, I mean, depending on your facility, of course, if you have a transportation that you do need to move your biogas onto your facility, you may not have the uh, constant production that you are looking for there. Okay. If that, if that answers the question. Well well, yeah, because on the next slide, we, we and this kind of goes in, we have a, another question from the tendon, um, is the RNG composition, because it, when you are talking about, you know, biogas and going into biomethane, you got different feedstocks, different inputs of waste, uh, where it's coming from, landfill, a manure farm, whatever it is, and then you got, so you got a bunch of variability in with the gas coming into us, and then you have to, I was trying to figure out, is there a major variable in the flow rates as well? Because that would be just very hard to 
build processing equipment to take the huge variation of swings. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's, it, there's consistency to, a, to a, a certain point, assuming that you're constantly adding new, new material. So if you, if you're running like a, like a manure digester and you only have material once a week, um, then there, there's probably swings as your, your, you know, initial gas production ramps up and down, uh, depending on how much of the, uh, the affluent that you're adding or the, um, the, the feedstock that you're adding into the system. Um, I mean, then really just based on how big your, your facility is and just how much, you know, carbon you're, you're adding in on the, the front end, um, to, to be able to produce everything. Uh, well, one I, uh, of the ones sites that we use that has a lot of variability is it's because they they have they're bringing gas from other facilities over and okay. then, because that's where they have the main facility has the main processing and so they um when that happens we see swings in, in our uh, sales volumes um because they're they're trucking in cng from other facilities but they're not cleaning it um the same way that they are at the uh, at those satellite facilities they're, they're just bringing it to the main one on this RNG composition, this is a breakdown below. So Charlie, can you kind of walk us through this of uh, what this composition is? Okay, um, basically it's just gonna give you your composition against natural gas here. Um, you know, we saw earlier just from our different sources where biogas, is, we're looking at 50 to 80% um, in methane or 30 to 50% carbon dioxide. So these are, uh, these numbers here, they're similar to what we just saw. Um, and so once you get through your processing, uh, your comparison between biomethane or RNG to natural gas, and you can just see side by side where you're, you know, pretty pretty compatible, of course, with methane, and then uh, you can get down on your carbon uh, carbon dioxide and your acid gases. Um, and again, we're looking at for it to be compatible. Compatible. So we're really trying to do, you know, process the same way that we would natural gas and get it um, with your, you know. Obviously, Chris uh, had mentioned earlier where you'll see in natural gas, you'll see your ethanes and your propanes, and uh, it's not something that you are going to see in biomethane, of course. Um, but, you know, just looking at the compatibility of the two. So the biogas to biomethane, just one more time, that's just like biogas is before processing and biomethane is after, hopefully, it goes through all of our equipment. Yeah, bio, biogas is what you'll get. Um, you know, you call it raw, right mm -hmm. out of your digester, um, and that, yeah, that's what you're looking at, where it's going to contain all these things here, fully saturated, et cetera. Well, and that was one of the questions: is what makes a plant uh, economically feasible uh, with that, and the efficiencies on the output? So, if you're, it's pretty well. I guess the composition. If a client came to us and say, "This is our biogas composition." what's it gonna take it to get to the biomethane levels that we need to meet spec? And then that's why we would do the proposals, how much iron oxide, the bigger the amine plan, D high. So it really is, I guess, what the composition of the biogas, is that right, Chris? Yeah, um, I mean, I really think it's, uh, really it's how much you're getting for that gas. Right. You know, what, what is that gas worth? If, if you're like here in, in Texas, like we have a huge chicken farm just down the street from, from our, uh, our shop here. And, um, you know, the, at that scale of all those, that chicken um, farm, if you, if you put it all together, then you could, you know, you're, you're getting closer to being able to possibly competing with, with the price of natural gas. The problem is natural gas is just so cheap in Texas that, you know, you, you'd have to get down to that. I mean, right now it's $5 in MCF, but, um, you know, $5, that's not going to last. Um, so, you know, $5 in MCF, being able to target that, you need some pretty good scale to be able to, to meet that. Um, you know, getting paid maybe $9 in MCF, uh, because it is RNG, mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe you're, you're able to work those economics, small volumes, though, it, it's going to be hard, because there's, there's obviously economies of scale, you know, there's only, you know, the smaller you build a naming plant, the, the less dollar per MCF of processing that or you're spending more per, you know, uh, MCF for that plant, just because you're trying to scale down big equipment. So everything right. does get cheaper, the, the larger it is. So you, you definitely do need, you know, if I had to throw a number out there, I'd say, you know, at least 500 to a, to a, um, a thousand MCF a day worth of gas production, you know, whatever that means for your inputs to be able to make that much. Cause you, you really want to be producing, you know, maybe a million cubic feet a day to, to really start, you know, working that economics favorably. 
Well, in our kind of going through this, though, why RNG is what is it? Why RNG and what is it used for? So, Charlize, uh, I know you've been doing a bunch of research, different states, different, I guess, politicians, political initiatives. So, what are the big ones that you see? What is it used for? So, mostly what you're going to be seeing used for is re- um, injected into pipelines um, for homes and businesses. We do have some companies out in Canada and California that are, have been already, you know, big into RNG. Mm-hmm. Um, the, where they will charge you a premium um, to, you know, I guess it's it's kind of more of a the personal preference it would seem the way that they advertise it. It's like hey, if you do want to contribute and be more green, um, then here's a premium, and we will inject, you know, we'll use you on this pipeline where you're going to be injected with RNG into what's provided into your homes or your businesses. Um, that said, it's you know it's a small percentage and it's a, just a monthly sort of uh, like a Passover fee in a sense. Um, and uh, and so that's like one thing that it's being used for in some cases. Um, I, again, you know, we've seen that where it's used to produce, to produce uh, electricity. Um, and then you can also use it and you can compress it and use it for your fill fleets um, and mass, parta- mass transportation as well, which is happening um, already in California where they are using these for their mass transportation. Um, and it's a cleaner burning fuel. So, you know, what, for all aspects, what RNG is trying to achieve, what we're trying to achieve with it is that, you know, it's going to be cleaner burning. And again, it's, you don't want to just burn it off and you're again creating more um, CO2 and more greenhouse gases and putting right. them into the air. Well, that, that kind of goes into your next one, the benefits of RNG. Um, the energy independence, I know, I was actually kind of reading some articles on that where, because um, you already got the byproduct or waste out there, right? The byproduct is uh, something, an energy source that we could be utilizing that kind of goes back into our independence. Um now, is that something, have you seen it where like uh, landfills are having to track how much waste or uh, emissions are coming off it? Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, with the administration and, you know, we're going to, they're, they're really pushing hard where they're going to um, start, maybe, you know, possibly start fining harder and they're going to want to know how much emissions are coming through. And, uh, you know, for example, the, this administration has been, has a target for, reduce emissions of 50% by yeah. 2030. Um, so yeah, we definitely, you'll definitely see them tracking what's coming out, what's, uh, you know, what their carbon footprint, you know, and they, you want to calculate your carbon footprint. Yeah, I think one thing interesting that you shared, Charlize, was that um, uh, the, that thing you shared with us a couple a week ago or so that was talking about that they're, they're looking at possibly passing like a methane uh, fine for, for a certain amount of methane uh, emission. And I mean, that, that if that passed, you know, that could open the door for, you know, inspection companies to just, you know, drive past your, your sewage treatment facility or your landfill mm-hmm. or whatever. And if, you know, with a FLIR camera or something, if they could actually, you know, measure what that amount is, they could just, you know, be sending you fines for that, that methane emission. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting um, that it could, you know, really become something that it's a, you know, a cost negative if the fines start eating in there. Well, that yeah, goes... the, EPA, the EPA has, you know, authority to do their flyovers too. Like you're saying, if somebody drives by, they could also just do like a drone flyover and catch you that way, basically. It's crazy. Well, that kind of goes into the market drivers for RNG. What are the biggest things that you see kind of pushing it or uh, into the future? So, like I said, you know, one, it's administration. Yes, the administration's changed, but, you know, maybe the policies kind of will push further even into changing administration. Um, you know, like, you know, the public policy. So we're paving the way for reducing our carbon footprint. And, and you know, we could say that America's a little behind even as far as like Europe or Canada, where they're really pushing hard for their, reducing their carbon footprint. Mm-hmm. Um You'll have um, again in the you know the the, redu- the reduction in emission targets. Um, uh, your circular economy approach is a is a big thing here. Um, I kind of mentioned it earlier, um, where 
it in your facility that you have, you can produce this raw biogas and, and then, you know, process your raw biogas and you could, and, you know, just put it right back around into your own facility where it's going to be filling your fleet and, um, you know, you, you're not going to have to pay outside to fill your fleet or to fill your plant. Um, so that's yeah, so you know, a video that, where it was like a dump truck or um, trash trucks because a lot of them run on, yeah. on CNG anyway and mm -hmm. they usually had like the fueling station and they were using the landfill gas directly to, to power the, the trash trucks mm -hmm. that's smart um, and so then you know looking at uh, government subsidies so you know again with the administration you're going to be getting a lot of push that way and granted RNG is you know more expensive um, but you can have some government funding and subsidies to help you along the way, especially with their intentions, with their goals. They're, they just want to push for that. Um, you know, you can think about things like the, the lowered infrastructure costs where you, you already have these dairy farms in existence. You already have these anaerobic uh, digesters in existence. Right. So it's just taking, you know, a few extra steps in processing instead of just flaring off your uh, biogas. Well, I kind of uh, wrap it up. So Croft, uh, as of right now, um, Croft is a natural gas processing company. So we were by demand kind of being pushed into the RNG processing side. We don't do the plant, the digesters. We don't do any of that. We partnered up with other companies that do that portion of it. And we focus on what we do best, which is the processing and the natural gas side. Um, but if there is any questions, if you have a biogas uh, project composition you would like for us to run simulations with, please reach out to us. Um, actually, uh, my contact information is below. Um, you can ship us your biogas composition, your research uh, that you're doing. If you just want simulations and basic estimates on the processing side, this is a perfect time for you to talk to us and for us to participate. Uh, now for a free hat or shirt, the biggest thing that we do, you will get a survey after this, uh, feedback is a huge thing for our company. We always believe in continuous improvement. We want this, um, trying to fit all of this information in one hour seems, things seem to kind of fall to the wayside. So if you got follow-up questions, please reach out to us. That's the reason why we're trying to do this because knowledge is power. We're trying to give that back. Uh, fill out that information, and then this is a professional development hour, so if you participated and you need it for your um, professional development hour, your continuing education, let us know, and then that way we can get that over to you. Uh, if you have any questions after this, again, Tori is going to be reaching out to everybody. Ship us your questions, and um, I appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, Chris and Charlize, thank you for putting this together. Charlize, you've done a lot of research on this, so people might be reaching out, and uh, I'll be passing them over to you to answer their questions. Sure. Okay. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you.